You probably all heard the story of Naaman from Syria. We, I remember in Sunday school singing the chorus, Naaman the captain had leprosy. You ever hear that chorus? Little kid's song. And, uh, and I'm going to compare that with some truth about baptism into Jesus Christ's death. So we're going to 2 Kings chapter 5 in the first verse. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master, and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance into Syria. Now, notice this, he was captain of the military. The whole nation of Syria and their military was led by this man, Naaman. And that meant he was second to the king. And by him the Lord had given deliverance to Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. Now just watch the providence of God in this situation. Syria takes captives from Israel. And I'm going to show you that this was all in God's plan. You might think bad things happen. A little girl, a little maid is captured and made a servant in another nation, but God had his hand in it. He's going to use that little girl. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. That little girl, she could have had bitterness in her heart against that whole family. They made her a slave in that house. But her heart was there for God and she said something that sparked an interest in Naaman's wife. Your husband, mistress, would be healed of that leprosy if he was just with the prophet of God in Samaria. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed, took him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel. Now, let's just pause there for a moment. Uh, this king of Syria felt, well, if there's a prophet in Samaria, the king of Israel should know about it. So I'm going to get a hold of my royal brother, the king of Israel, and send him a note. We want some recovery for our captain. So he said, now when this letter is come unto thee, Behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes. Back in Israel, you know, we kind of punch the wall or kick the cat or something. They grab their robe and rip it when they're really upset. And he, he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends me sends unto me to recover a man of leprosy? Wherefore I consider, I pray you, and see how he seeks a quarrel against me. In other words, he knows I'm not going to be able to heal him. He must just want to make a war with the nation of Israel and absolutely misunderstood what was going on. You know, there's something when things seem to go wrong. Israel's little maid was captured. This king of Israel completely misunderstands the intention of the king of Syria. All the king of Syria wanted was his captain to be recovered from leprosy. And he just thinks there's a big war going on. They think there's a big battle coming. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, this is the prophet that that little girl was talking about. Elisha. He heard that the king of Israel rent his clothes. He said, oh boy, the king's upset. We don't want the king upset. He sent to the king saying, wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. In other words, the king didn't even realize. There's a man of God here. We can deal with this situation. So Naaman came with horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Now notice... Elisha never went to the door. This was a, one of the highest men in Syria that had come personally to his door. Second to the king. And Elisha says, I'm not going to see him at the door. Here, servant, go tell him a message. And he says, go tell him to dip 
and wash himself in the Jordan River seven times. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. In other words, do some big abracadabra, find where the uh, leprosy in his body, put his hand on it and heal it. And, uh, and then he says, Are not our Abana and Farpar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? See, Jordan was so muddy that if you were to go there to this day, it's got a clay-like color through the whole river. Now, I, I did research. I found out what um, the two rivers in Syria actually are today. Abana and Farpar. I didn't bother to get their names, though. But they're crystal clear. And so not only if water was going to cleanse leprosy, he could have stayed home and gone into a river there, he thought. But they're far cleaner than they are in Israel too. There's not a river in Israel as clean as these two rivers in Syria. What a waste of time. What a waste of effort to come all the way down and not even have that prophet give him the courtesy of meeting him personally. After all, I'm the captain of Syria. <laughs> God was humbling that guy. <laughs> And so he said, May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and went away in a rage. And his servant came near and spake to him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, would you not have done it? If he had some big grandiose, big showcase of a ritual where you'd really look important, you probably would have gone out of your way to do it. How much rather than when he says to thee, Wash and be clean? A simple thing, like just go to a river, dip seven times, and that's it. You would have done it. It was far more complex because of your pride. <laughs> but all he's asking you to do is go to Jordan and dip seven times. Then he went down, dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Notice it doesn't say he was healed. He was what? Clean. See, leprosy isn't something that you ever see people quote-unquote healed of. It's something different. They say when a leper is recovered, he's not healed, he's cleansed. And what does a leper cry when you come within so many feet of him? Unclean, unclean. He's got a black hood on his head and the Bible says that he's commanded to cry out unclean, unclean, because leprosy was highly contagious. Keep away from him. He didn't say diseased, diseased. He said unclean, unclean. And leprosy, because of that, is a perfect symbol of sin in our lives. We don't get healed of sin, do we? We get cleansed. We get washed. And leprosy in the Bible represents sin. And so this man, and if you go back to the first verse, it says, God had given deliverance unto Syria by this man. <clears throat> and, and my mind seems to somehow go back to Adam. God had given Adam power over the earth. But then sin got a hold of Adam and he was out of commission. And look at the world now. They really have power over the earth now, don't they? They're destroying it, and they can't take it. Uh, I've, I've never heard of so many tornadoes. One, one uh, cousin of mine is pastoring down in uh, Joliet, is it? Is it Missouri? Uh, somewhere where a tornado just ripped up half the city a few months ago, and we were really concerned if it had hit his part of the city and where he was living, but it didn't. But tornadoes and things ripping across, I believe that if this country would repent, that stuff would stop. Because the Bible says, if my people will humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, I'll heal their land. Things like that would stop. That's why, church, we're the salt of the earth. We need to really believe God for our nation. And, and America's really going through it. And you can see the iniquity and why. But... Um, it's just like this man had power and here, struck with leprosy, he was now unclean and, um, and so that represents sin. It's not just a regular disease in the Bible. Now, as I said, a little maid, a girl, was taken from Israel and brought into his house. And God 
had this all planned out that Naaman would come in contact with Naaman, uh, with Elisha rather, because of this little girl. When he sent word to the king, the king either forgot about Elisha or didn't even know what was going on. By the way, when it said God had used Naaman to bring deliverance to Israel, do you happen to know the king that was just knocked out of office before this story happened? Ahab. And remember there was a captain that drew a bow just by coincidence and shot it in the air? Remember I said there are no coincidences hardly? And that bow struck Ahab right between his shoulders and he was disguised as a normal soldier because there was a prophecy that was told, you are going to die in battle, king. Remember we were teaching on false prophets and prophets and all the false ones said, oh no, king, you're going to be all right. But um, the men of God said, no, you're going to die. In fact, that was Elijah. And uh, so at any rate, that, I wonder if that might have been that man Naaman. Shot, he was a captain of Syria. And then we read, by Naaman's hand, he had delivered the kingdom of Syria. Any, at any rate, um, he, came, he comes to Elisha's door. He specks this big, grand, and glorious welcome. And so there's nothing glorious about sin. I don't care if it's the Prime Minister of Canada or if it's the Queen of England. If there's sin in their lives, God has no respect to persons. You're unclean. You just need to get cleansed so that you can live for me and be in my kingdom. And I think what God's doing is taking this grand man, this situation, and letting us realize, folks, God doesn't care. There's only two things he sees. He either sees Adam or he sees Christ. In other words, he sees people in sin or he sees people cleansed of their sins. Aren't you glad God's no respect of persons? And I remember Paul said, I used to look at people after the flesh, but I don't look after the flesh anymore. In other words, if the Queen of England had walked into this room this morning and Paul the Apostle was sitting there, and then a little girl walked in here, filled with the power of God, repentant of her sins, serving Jesus. He would be more excited to see that little girl than he would the Queen of England. Amen. And so Naaman was nothing more than a sinner. It doesn't matter what, how, many, how much money people have, how much fame they have. I'm so glad God's no respecter of persons. They need to get right with God as much as anybody else. And so always understand, don't look at your life and your situation as somebody so low that God can't stand you. He loves everyone on an equal basis, praise God. And I don't care if it's Naaman. In fact, if you go, this is 2 Kings chapter 5. If you go to 2 Kings chapter 4, you read about a little boy that was raised from the dead by Elisha. In fact, I, I'm waiting on God because I, when I was studying this, the Spirit was really speaking to me and I'm not getting it all yet, and so I'm going to have more about this. But both 2 Kings 4 and 2 Kings 5, a little boy raised from the dead and a big mighty captain of Syria cleansed from his leprosy, both have a powerful message of water baptism in the name of Jesus. Watch how this comes out. Dipping seven times in Jordan not only cleansed Naaman from his leprosy, but how many have ever read in Leviticus 14 the ritual of the cleansing of the leper? You ever read that? It's a powerful, powerful symbolic message. Let's go there. Leviticus 14. <clears throat> the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought unto the priest. I want you to picture this. The priest shall go forth out of the camp, and the priest shall look. Now, the reason, does anybody know why he said the priest had to go out of the camp? Lepers weren't allowed in the community. They had to go out. They had leper colonies. And so this man is going to see the priest. The priest has to meet him outside of the camp. And the priest shall look and behold, if the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper. Notice the leprosy is already gone at this point. This ritual is there because the leprosy was already dealt with. Then shall the priest command to take for him that is to be cleansed two birds. Now you might say, well, if he's already healed, how come he needs to be cleansed? And remember I used the word healed? We do see the word healed here, but notice the cleansing is the next step. That's the one I'm focusing on today. He's not cleansed yet. He hasn't gone through this ceremony. Two birds. It doesn't matter what kind of birds they are as long as they're alive and clean. 
and cedar wood. How many know what's unique about cedar wood? What's different about cedar wood? What do they use cedar wood for? It's incorruptible. It doesn't rot. And uh, back home, we, mom and dad had a cedar closet. Moths can't stand that. You can have your clothes in there, there won't be any moths that will bother in those clothes. And cedar chests and so forth to hold clothes. Cedar represents immortality and eternal life. It's an evergreen. And something that's evergreen is like a, eternal life, so to speak. See what I'm saying? And scarlet. And this is either wool that's been dyed red or it's a scarlet cord. But how many know what color the blood of Jesus was? And hyssop. Now, there's something interesting when you compare cedar and hyssop. Hyssop, and I'm going to show you this later on, is the smallest of trees. It's actually considered a tree. And guess what cedar is? The largest of trees. If you compare trees, there's a verse that says that. So he takes cedar, he takes scarlet, which represents the blood of Jesus, and he takes hyssop from the largest trees to the smallest trees, from captains of nations to bums on the street. <laughs> there's something between them both. It's the scarlet. From the cedar to the hyssop, there's the blood of Jesus. Folks, the blood of Jesus puts us all on an equal level. There's not one of us that's greater than the other. And that blood will cleanse the king as well as it will a peasant. And the priest shall command that one of the birds, remember he took two birds, one of the birds is killed in an earthen vessel over running water. Now that doesn't mean he has to find some water that's moving. It's in a vessel. How could it be running water if it's in a vessel? Does anybody know? <laughs> took it from a river or a stream. You know why it was taken from a river or a stream? because that's the cleanest kind of water you can find. Everything had to be clean. The birds, they had to be clean birds. And what I mean by clean and unclean, you know how in the Old Testament some food was clean and unclean? Kosher. You had to have a kosher bird. <laughs> Can't eat lobster if you're a Jew. That's unclean. And these birds, and of course, I believe it's good health advice. I don't think we have to eat that to be saved, but it's good health advice. There's a reason God said they're unclean, because they could make you sick. I mean, lobsters are bottom feeders. Can you imagine what they're eating? <laughs> and, um, and so cedar, that's clean. It's incorruptible. And they take this living bird and kill it, and its blood flows down into that clean living water in that vessel. And as for the living bird that's left alive, he takes it, and he takes that cedar wood, and the scarlet and the hyssop, and he takes that all as a big bundle, and he dips them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And then he takes that saturated, soaked handful, the bird, the hyssop, the, the scarlet, and the, the cedar, and he sprinkles it all over that leper seven times. Now, how many times did Naaman have to dip into the Jordan? Seven times. You see, God was doing something with Naaman by dipping him in the Jordan seven times that was very similar to the cleansing of the leper because Naaman was a leper. And he, the leper was sprinkled seven times with that blood. And by the way, since we're talking about... Um, well, let me hold that. I'll get that in a minute. Don't want to get ahead of myself. And he shall pronounce him clean and then that living bird that was dipped down into that water... He sets it free, and it's loosed into the open field. One bird was killed, and in its blood, the living bird was dipped, and he was set free. Whew. This is what water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ is all about. Now, we've, we've taught for six weeks about rightly dividing the word, the gospel that the apostles preached. Not just any Lord's Prayer gospel and all that. And I appreciate all their efforts. I appreciate everything. But it's like, remember, Priscilla and Aquila showed Apollos the way more perfectly. Here's, let's go further. Let's go deeper into the word with you, Apollos. And, and then they got him into repentance and water baptism and all of this. And, and so, let alone people understanding repentance and baptism for the remission of sins is the proper response to the gospel 
And God bless them, but raising the hands and accepting Jesus as a Savior, that's not what God's wanting. It, it, it's on their way. I believe it's, let me get this straight, it's on the way. I believe God's working with those people. But let's bring them all the way. Amen. Bring them to repentance. Bring them to baptism for the remission of sins. Because if leprosy represents sin, and they're going to deal with the leper by dipping him seven times in the Jordan, and even if you get a Greek version of the Old Testament, the word dip is baptism, baptizo. They're actually showing a baptism in the Jordan River of, 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 of Naaman. And how many times? And what's seven represent in the Bible? Completion. He was completely getting his leprosy cleansed from his flesh. Which represents when we're baptized in Jesus' name, we are completely having our sins washed and gone and removed from our lives. Somebody say remission of sins. Praise God. And that living bird, by the same token, was dipped into that blood from the dead bird. And then it was released. And it's just like us. You see, when we're baptized, we're baptized into Jesus Christ's death. It's like we're immersed into his experience of death so that we can be buried with him and we can resurrect with him. If we're going to resurrect with Jesus, we've got to first die with him. And that death is the part that deals with sin. What got us into Adam? How did we get into the human race? We were born. And as soon as you sucked in your first breath of life, you were a sinner before you did anything. You're born in sin. Adam made you a sinner. If my grandfather had never come to Canada, I would have been born in Germany. But because of his actions, I was born in Canada. By the same token, if our great-great-grandpappy Adam had never sinned and was thrown out of the Garden of Eden, we'd all be born sinless in the Garden of Eden and we'd be there to this day. And the Garden would have spread across the whole earth, I believe, because we'd have 8 billion people to deal with about. <coughs> but the actions of Adam caused us to be what we are. And we got into this by birth. And so, bless God, we're going to get out of it by death. And I can say I died to all of that sin when I was immersed, like Naaman was immersed in that Jordan. Like, like that living bird was immersed into the blood and the water of the dead bird. And then, just like that bird was taken out and released, we were taken out and clean and free from sin. We've got remission of sin. The leprosy is gone. We were born lepers, spiritually speaking. And that's the rage that's inside of us and the force that pulls us down and tears at us. I preached last week like Daniel in the lion's den and these lions of sin that are in our lives. And, and God has set us free from that power. And, and we need to stand in faith on it. And that's, I had Brad get up, and, get up and talk about how we need to have faith in that. We're dead to that stuff now. We're dead to it. Bless God. And I'm learning that more and more. I've gone through things in the last few years that I told you about being in California where I never in my personal ministry had ever been attacked so severely. And I learned, I probably could never have done that years ago, but I'd come to the place where, thank God, I'm going to preach anyway. And I'm not going to let that affect my preaching. And there were people that were attacking me personally, and I just ignored them and just preached as if they weren't even there. Because that's what the death of Jesus Christ is supposed to be in our lives. I'm dead to that stuff. And bless God, I've got more to grow in. I've got more to deal with. I'm still learning myself. But thank God I've come as far as I've come. And thank God you've come as far as you come. Because when God could take that word and separate your soul and all your emotions from your spirit that you use to do your ministry and your work for God... This isn't going to be affected anymore by that. It's been separated. And you're going to do the will of God anyway. And watch out. Buckle your seatbelts. We're studying this. I'm going to be teaching on offenses Wednesday night. And watch for things to come. And I noticed, and I don't know if you noticed this, but we had seven, we had nine baptisms in the name of Jesus a few months ago. And all of a sudden, things started happening. Have you noticed it? The devil's not going to sit back and let this stuff happen. 
And for some reason, God says, I want you to readdress this issue. I want you to go back. And I had my mind. I thought we were going in this direction, God. And he said, no, I couldn't get away from it. I said, okay, Lord, it's your church. And, and, and he shows us dipping that living bird and setting it free. And that represents that leper. He's cleansed. And it's verse 7. He shall sprinkle upon him that is be cleansed from leprosy seven times. Perfect cleansing. And in verse 8, after the living bird is let loose, he that is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes, shave off all his hair, shave himself, wash himself in water, that he may be clean. And after that, he shall come into the camp and shall tarry abroad out of his house tent seven days. In other words, we can go back in the garden now. Praise God. We're back in the garden. We're back in the people of God and in the community of God. And all of this was done after the leprosy was all actually gone from the person. So, seven times, perfect washing. And if you really want to understand the place of baptism, there it is. Amen. Now, look at this. Here it is, Acts 2.30. Peter said to them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. That is what baptism is for. It's for the remission of sins. And then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This we showed you through the weeks was preached in Acts 8. It was preached in Acts 10, Acts 16, Acts 19, Acts 22. It's through the whole book of Acts. And so these two birds, notice the birds had to be clean too. The, the cedar, the hyssop, all of that represents the same thing. A lot of this I already talked about. Now watch this verse concerning the seed and the hyssop. 1 Kings 4 and 33. This is Solomon. I could imagine that there's botanists and biologists that wish Solomon's writings were still around. Because in 1 Kings 4, the Bible says God gave him wisdom over all creatures, over all animals, over all creeping things. That man was, God made him a genius. And he spake of the trees. And notice the language. From the cedar tree that is Lebanon, even unto the hyssop that springeth out of the wall. See, that's where hyssop is actually a tree. In other words, from the biggest of trees, the cedar, to the little ones that come out of walls, the hyssop. And so when we read that God took cedar and hyssop and scarlet and bound them together with that living bird and dipped them in the water. It's like God says, I don't care if it's the greatest of great. I don't care if it's the smallest of smallest. The blood of Jesus puts us all on one level. And God thinks as much of you as he does anybody else. Praise God. Aren't you glad for that? It doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter what you're going through. He looks beyond all your faults and sees that need. And he, for one soul that repents, the Bible says, all of heaven rejoices. It could be in a back alley downtown New York City where somebody's slobbering in their alcohol and a preacher comes by and asks them, why don't you just repent and ask Jesus to forgive you? And that man repents. All of heaven has noticed it. When the average person would walk by and probably scoff. Heaven doesn't. From the great cedar to the little hyssop, the scarlet blood of Jesus brings us all on one level. Praise God. And so in Acts 22 and 16, notice that it says he would be washed and cleansed from his leprosy. It says, why are you tarrying? This is Paul giving his testimony. Arise, be baptized, and wash away. Look at the language it's using. You're washing away your sins. Baptism is remission of sins or washing. Another word for remission is forgiveness. And you're doing it calling on the name of the Lord. And I, I always want to bring this out in case you haven't heard it. If you've been baptized, but the name of Jesus wasn't invoked, and it was maybe Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, or whatever, get baptized with Jesus' name being spoken over you. Because how many know there's power in the name of Jesus Christ? Now, you might have heard, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, in the name of Jesus. I believe the name of Jesus has been invoked. Or they might have a variation of it. You see in the name of Jesus Christ. You see in the name of Jesus in the book of Acts. As long as that name Jesus is invoked, Amen. That's the point. And there it is again, Acts 2.38. In the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Matthew 26 and 28. Now notice, he says baptism. You're baptized. 
for the remission of sins. But then Jesus said in Matthew 26 and 28, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many, for what? The remission of sins. Now I thought baptism was for the remission of sins. Well, here it's saying the blood of Jesus is shed for the remission of sins. That's why when the bird was dipped, baptized, so to speak, blood was in that water. Because that's how the blood of Jesus is applied. Oh my, the Lord's showing me something right now. Does anybody remember what was used to put blood on the doorway in Egypt? Hyssop. Hyssop is like an applicator. And we already said it's like the smallest of trees. And what else concerning trees and the smallest do you read Jesus talking about in the New Testament? Mustard seed. Mustard seed. Faith. Faith. And what did he say? That faith is like a mustard seed. It's the smallest of all seeds. But when that thing grows, it's the biggest of all trees. It's like going from the hyssop to the cedar, spiritually speaking. And you know what I think he's trying to say is faith applies the blood of Jesus to our lives. You see, if you get baptized, if you were a baby, you've got no faith to apply the blood of Jesus in your baptism. And because baptism remits sins, and because the blood of Jesus remits sins, see, it's there for the baptism, it's there for the blood, then the only way that can work and not contradict each other is when you're baptized, have faith that the blood of Jesus is in this. Now, it's not like somebody comes by with a syringe, they just suck the blood of Jesus out of his body with and then squirts it into that body so when you're baptized, you're baptized in the blood. It's representative of the death of Jesus. Blood in the body is what? The life of the flesh. So out of the body, what is it? It's death. If blood is the life of the flesh, take the blood out and there's death. And when Jesus shed his blood, he died. So the reason it says that the blood is for remission of sins, the word blood just represents and stands for his whole death on the cross. And it's that death you're actually baptized into when you see a picture of the bird being dipped in the blood. <laughs> and that's why, whew, that's why the blood was struck on the doorposts in Egypt by the hyssop. Same thing that was in with the bird when it went into the water. And they walked through the door. And when you go through a door, you're in a house. And remember when we were, Amber was leading us in the worship, and we thought, saw in Christ alone, no power of hell can get us or take us from his hand. In Christ I stand. And as long as I'm standing in Christ, until death comes or Jesus takes me home, I'm indestructible. But you see what the devil does is he knows that while we're in Christ, and let me elaborate on in Christ before I go further. Being in Christ means you have faith. I'm in Christ. I was baptized into his death, and ever since then I've been in him, and I ain't ever going to leave him. I'm staying in him. And when I stay in him, that means I have the faith. I'm going to depend on his death to all that comes against me in life in this world and have faith. It's not going to harm me. It's not going to harm me. And when God sees your faith in that death and it has done that for you and you know it, then He anoints you. He brings you through struggles you couldn't go through before. The reason struggles bother us if we've lost, is we've lost our faith that we're in Christ. Because it's like Peter walking on water. Jesus, if that's you, bid me to come on the water. And Jesus said, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter takes a step on the water. And whew, he started walking. He was walking for we don't know how many steps. But what, what went wrong? He looked at the problem. He looked at the waves. He got his eyes off Jesus. He looked at the waves and he sunk. And that's what happens to us. We take a step and we stay looking at Jesus. I'm dead with him. I'm dead with him. And as long as we keep that in our focus and not focus on the problem, we're not going to sink. But the reason we sink, and we're going to teach on this, we're going to get into the Word, because folks, there's a lot of things we can teach and preach on and a lot of things we can talk about. But if there's something we need to get a handle on, is going through the storm and still holding on to our faith that we're in Christ. Praise God. And the devil knows if he can get us out from within Christ, 
Just like him looking through the windows of that Hebrew home as the death angel was looking. And remember, the Bible says if the blood's on the door, death could not take that person inside. Then I imagine the devil's looking through and yelling. The devil's bound, folks, but he's not gagged. Think of it. The devil's bound, but he's not gagged. He can talk. He can deceive. He can lie. That's why you've got to get your nose in that book and get this in your heart. Because he will say things, try to erode your faith, and try to deceive you to get you to walk outside of that blood-stained doorway where he can get you. You're in his jurisdiction now. So as long as you're saying, no, I'm bought by the blood of Jesus, devil, you can't touch me. I'm going to stay here. And you hold on to that faith in God. It's when we throw it all away and we run out that we fall. So folks, I think God's trying to show us, you get into Jesus by baptism into his death. Now, stay there. Learn how to stay there. Praise God. Look in 1 John 1 and 7. If we walk in the light as He is in the light. How many know God's in the light? We have fellowship one with another. As long as you're in this house where the blood's on the door. It's like being in the garden. As long as you're in the garden, you're in fellowship with God. But when God cast Adam out of the garden, He broke His fellowship with him. We have fellowship, and look what happens as long as you have fellowship. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, does what? cleanseth from all sin. I'm going to go a step further with this blood issue. When you get baptized into Jesus like that bird's immersed into the blood of the dead bird, that blood doesn't just cleanse you once. It cleanseth you as long as you're in fellowship with God. You just stay in that house and it's like your eyes blink involuntarily and wash your whole eyeball without you even putting forth any thought. The blood of Jesus just cleanses you continually as long as you keep that faith. Isn't that awesome? If something happens to corrupt my life, the blood of Jesus is there washing it. Why? Because something might have happened, something might have slipped, but I'm not getting out of this house, Lord. I'm not walking through that door to the exit and go out. I'm staying in here because the enemy's out there and he'll tear my life to pieces. But if I stay here, God cleanses me and he keeps me clean. Aren't you glad the blood keeps us clean? It's not a one-time deal. It cleanseth. And so remission of sins is by the blood in Matthew 26 and it's by baptism in Jesus' name in Acts 2.38 because water baptism in Acts 2.38 into the death of Jesus is represented by the blood that he shed. That death that he shed. It's like you're baptized into his death. When you see a picture of something immersed in blood, it's somebody baptized into the death of Jesus. And you have just conquered the greatest force you'll ever have to face. Death. You're dead to death. <laughs> How'd you like to be dead to death? If you're immune, John G. Lake, somebody put a plague in his hand, a disease, they looked at it under the microscope, those things died in his hand. He was dead to that disease. It couldn't affect him. And when we're dead to death. So we're immersed or dipped. And remember Romans 6? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. And so, folks, this shows us baptism isn't sprinkling. They call it effusion in some churches where they sprinkle or pour. No, in the Bible, they immersed people. And they said, in the name of Jesus Christ, to boot. And so he was died. He died, rather. He was buried in a tomb in our place. He did it in our place. And as soon as we recognize that and get baptized in Jesus' name, then that death is now ours and we're impenetrable to the devil. He can't touch us. Praise God. And that living bird and dipping it into the water represents all of that. And what they do with that bird? They let it free. Fly back to your nest now. Go back. And what did Naaman do? You keep reading the story, he goes back to Syria. And there's some beautiful, beautiful things that happen when he went back. But hold on for that in a minute. By the way, when the bloodied water was sprinkled on that leper, they took the living bird, the cedar, the hyssop, and the scarlet, dipped it in, immersed it into that blood and water from the dead bird, 
and then they sprinkled that man seven times with it. That was a message symbolizing what happened here symbolically has just happened to you spiritually. Your leprosy's gone. You're cleansed. Praise God. And Jesus Christ, we've got to identify with him. We've got to realize what happened with him. That's for me. And I could say I've been washed by the blood of Jesus by faith. I've identified. How many know what I mean by identifying with it? Huh? So the life of the bird was taken as though it was the life of that person. Because sin, you have to die if you've committed sin. It's just like you're on death row, buddy, because you committed a crime. It's worthy of the death penalty. All of us had sin, and we're on death row. And Jesus says, I'll take the death penalty for you. And then his death counts as all our death penalties, and we're all free to go now. It's been done. Praise God. Le lepers represent people who have sin. And I've, Jesus died because we had to die. Watch this carefully, Hebrews 9 and 27. As it is appointed unto men, what? Once to die. Notice it's appointed for us. We, each of us, have to die once. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Now look at this. I have here, can we all see the answer as to why verse 28 says Jesus was once offered to die when you read verse 27. Why was Jesus offered once? Because it's appointed unto us to die once. Everybody reads that and they stop at verse 27 and they say, oh yeah, we all got to die. We're all going to die. We've got to face God in the judgment. And they think that's the... No, that's not what he's... Keep reading. We've got to die once. And that's why Jesus died once. Like, it's like me saying to Marty, I've got to go to Winnipeg. And Marty says, okay, so I'll go. And I go thinking, well, what are you going for? I'm going for you. So you don't have to go. You could say, Mike, that you went to Winnipeg through me. I'll go for you. And that's exactly what happened to Jesus. He died. So we could say, we died. We had to have one death. Jesus said, okay, you all have, have to die once, right? I'll take it. I'll take your death once. <laughs> Woo, how many know he took it? Praise God. And so, in other words, he died once because it's appointed for us to die. See, this is what I'm, I'm trying to get at, this one major point. We had a death penalty due to the crime of sin. And we've got to die. So by being immersed into the blood, symbolically, or being baptized in Jesus' name. All of that represents we're into the death of Jesus, and now my judgment's been taken care of. All of what I would have to face God with on the white throne judgment at the great last day, when every one of us will stand before God. For us who are saved, it was already taken care of 2,000 years ago. Praise God. I was already judged on the cross. And that's why the... Apostle Paul said, some men's sins go before them, and some men's sins follow after. You ever stop and think of that? How come some men's sins go before them? Our, the people who are saved, our sins have already gone before us and we're already judged. These people's sins are following them right to the judgment, and then they're going to be judged. And you know what? I'd rather take three days, 2,000 years ago, of judgment for my sins when I wasn't even there, then take an eternity in hell for my sins where I'm going to be there. Whew. Let that sink in for a second. I'd rather take... See, Jesus took my punishment and he was three days in the earth because of it, dead. And he says, now this can be yours if you'll accept that this is yours. If you take this, you will bypass an eternity in hell. What do you want? You want your sins to go before you now? Or do you want to reject this and have them follow you right through the white throne judgment? And you won't get rid of them there. I had mine taken care of 2,000 years ago. <laughs> I don't, one guy came to me in Winnipeg. And he said, Mike, and he had been coming up for prayer for somebody else for weeks. And I'd honor that and I'd pray for what he asked for. But I knew he needed to pray for more. He needed to get saved. He wasn't even saved. And how many know God's not even obligated to answer a person's prayer if they're not saved? He often does, but he's certainly not obligated to it. But anyway, he said this one night, 
And I said, thank you, Lord. He said, and what about me, Mike? And I'd been waiting to hear that for weeks. I've done some awful things. You don't know. I mean, they're bad. I said, brother, I said, brother, by faith, it doesn't matter what you did. Jesus died for all of it. It's already judged if you'll only believe it. He said, it's been bad, though. I said, I don't care. You don't have to tell me. I know what the Bible says. God forgets it if you'll ask him to forgive you. I said, let's pray. He said, yes. We prayed. Woo, I tell you, heaven was going through his party that day. <laughs> One soul repented. Praise God. And so, watch this now. John 19 and 34. Remember when Jesus was on the cross? He'd already given up the ghost. Give forth his last breath. One of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. And out came what? Blood and water. The very thing that was in that bowl that they dipped the living bird in. And when did the soldier do this? While he was still alive? No. They did it after he was dead. So blood and water, again, screaming at us from even another angle, represents the death of Jesus Christ. Praise God. And look in 1 Corinthians 6, 11. Such were some of you. And if you read chapter 6, he talks about homosexuality. He talks about murders. He talks about uh, all kinds of sinful people. He says, and such were. Aren't you glad there's a were there? Were some of you. But you're what? The very thing they did with a leper. You're washed. You are sanctified. You are justified. How? In the name of the Lord. That's talking about baptism. You're washed in the name of Jesus Christ. Baptism's the only thing in the whole Bible that fulfills that. And so Paul's kind of reflecting on that. He says, you're washed. In fact, he says to Timothy, the washing of regeneration. And there again, he's talking about baptism. And so that bird... Now, I want to bring out one more point. In Leviticus 16, when I read where there was two birds and one was loosed and allowed to go free and the other one was dead, my mind immediately went to this chapter, Leviticus 16. Somebody say, 16 is the atonement chapter. This is, if you ever want to study atonement, what two words make up the word atonement? At one. I became at one with Jesus' death. I was atoned. And look at the atonement ritual. He will take two goats, present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Aaron will cast lots upon the two goats. One lot for the Lord, the other lot for the scapegoat. You ever heard the term scapegoat? Here's where it comes from. Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. He sacrificed that one. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord. One bird was killed, one was alive. One goat was killed, one was alive. To make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Now there's something different about letting this goat go compared to letting the bird go. Watch. Verse 21. Aaron shall lay both hands upon the head of the live goat. And look what he's confessing over him. What's it say? All the iniquities... Of the children of Israel, all their transgressions and all their sins. He's laying hands on this living scapegoat and he's confessing all the sins of Israel. He's transferring all their sins into that beast. And shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited. And he shall let the goat go in the wilderness. You know what a scapegoat is? Let's use him. Put all the blame on him so we get off with it. And they have a scapegoat. Well, that came from the Bible. Take that goat. Put all our sins on him and send him away so we're free. Woo, can you see the same thing about remission of sins? But watch it in the contemporary English version. This is unbelievable. Watch this. Then you will lead the two goats into my presence at the front of the sacred tent where I will show you which goat will be sacrificed to me and which one will be sent unto the desert to the demon Azazel. Now the Hebrew brings out a whole new angle to this. 
This is a more literal version. After you offer the first goat as a sacrifice for sin, the other one must be presented to me alive before you send it into the desert to take away the sins of the people. Now look at the message version. Then he will set the two goats before God at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Cast lots over the two goats. One lot for God, the other lot for Azazel. He will offer the goat on which the lot to God falls as an absolution offering, sacrifice. The goat on which the lot for Azazel falls will be sent out into the wilderness to Azazel to make atonement. If you offer one goat to God and another one to Azazel, how many know God is the God of the universe? He's the king of kings of all holiness. Now, Azazel isn't some child's mythological little demon running around. It is talking about Satan himself. You're going to the head of the kingdom of God and you're going to the head of the kingdom of darkness. And the lot... And you know what is so interesting? It's like Jesus represents both of them. Jesus, the Son of God, was offered and the Father looked down and saw a pleasing sacrifice. Remember he said, my God, my God. He was praying to the Father. And he was offered as a pleasing sacrifice in death. It had to be offered before God in death. And then they take the other one that's for Azazel, the devil. Because Jesus was put under the attack of Satan where Satan bruised his heel. Remember? The seed of the woman. Serpent, you're going to bruise his heel. You're going to attack him. You're going to kill him. You're going to bruise. The death of Jesus on the cross was like bruising his heel. But the devil didn't remember the rest of the story. But he is going to bruise your head. And so, well, it's like that living goat. Jesus took our sins so we could be free. The scapegoat went in towards the devil into a wilderness land, uninhabited. How many know demons walk through dry places? Where was Jesus tempted three, three times? In the wilderness. And that goat, that's the scapegoat, represents the Lord put under the attack of the devil. But Jesus Christ crushed his head by dying and resurrecting again. Amen. Isn't that awesome? And that's atonement. Somebody say atonement. That's atonement. He takes away our sin. The devil was allowed to bruise him. The devil was allowed to kill him. But bless God, that death that we're baptized into was busted wide open by his resurrection three days later. And it's like he crushed the serpent's head and destroyed the power. The head represents power. Man is the head of the house. Man is the power of the home. And he represents the final. The head is where the decision, the final decision. And praise God, Jesus had the final decision against the devil. He crushed the devil's head. Thank you, Lord. Somebody say atonement. And in closing, and you know, this is a bit, I didn't want to take as long as I have in the last couple Sundays, but we have lots of time for ministering still. But I want to show you about Naaman at the end of the story. Naaman came up out of that water with the flesh of a little child after he was dipped. That living bird represented him. The atonement was made. And you know why it says he came up with the flesh as a little child? We're born again by the water and by the Spirit. Water baptism in Jesus' name is being born of the water, folks. People get all kinds of theories about being born of the water. Being, but go to the book of Acts and find out what the water was. What was the water and the Spirit? Go to the book of Acts. Holy Ghost baptism, water baptism. And bless God, when he came up out of being immersed, and how many know Jesus was baptized in the same Jordan River centuries later? This was the Jordan name and was baptized in. Seven times, perfect cleansing. You get baptized in Jesus' name, that's perfect cleansing. You are born again. You get the flesh of a little child. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? Praise God. Baptism's being born of the water. It's part of the new birth. And you know, watch this in 2 Kings 5 and 15. He returned to the man of God. He and all his company came and stood before him and said, Behold, now I know there's no God in all the earth but in Israel. This proud man got humbled. He comes right back. He says, I know now there's no God but the God of Israel. 
I couldn't have got anything out of the rivers. In fact, I'm going to go further than that. And he said, the land of Israel is blessed. Forget our crystal clear waters in Syria. I don't care how muddy Jordan is. Your river and your land are so blessed. And he said, I pray thee, take a blessing of your servant. And Elisha says, as the Lord liveth whom, before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it. But he said, no. In other words, you can't buy this, folks. You can't buy this. And Naaman said, shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to your servant two mules burden of earth? Give me two donkeys and uh, give me as much earth from your blessed land as you can that two donkeys can carry it. I want to take part of your land back to Syria with me. And he says, For your servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. In other words, I'm going to build myself an altar when I get home, and it's going to be from land that's down here in Israel. Now, you could take land from Israel now and bring it over here. It'll do nothing for you. God's finished with using the material. How many know it's all in the Spirit now? So don't get mixed up in those things because you're going back under the Old Covenant. This was symbolism, folks. There's no holy land anymore. You know what the only holy land is now? I'm made from the dust of the earth, and here's holy land. Woo, us. So maybe people take a chunk of us home with them or something. <laughs> but there's no holy land anymore. You know, that's, that helps the tourists out in the Middle East, but folks, we're on holy ground everywhere. We're on holy ground here in Canada Inns and Portage of Prairie right now. Amen. And over in Israel might be a bomb going off somewhere in Tel Aviv, but there's holy ground in Canada. And there's holy ground too there if they believe. And, and, but it says, I want to take... Now remember Naaman had just said earlier, all the rivers in Syria are better than anything in Israel. Well, he got a change of mind now. He says, man, I want to take some of your dirt back with me. Praise God. He came out of the darkness of Syria, a nation of idol worshippers, came into the light of Israel. And he says, i got to bring back some of this Israel into Syria. And every time I sacrifice, it's going to be to God. And I'm going to stand on your earth just like I'm in your own nation with you, serving the God of Israel. Woo, aren't you glad? Praise God we could take something out of the kingdom. Amen. And bring it. And so, Naaman returned back to that place of power, cleansed of his leprosy. And God wants to bring all of us. We're meant to be kings, folks. We're meant to be kings and priests. We're not meant to be sinners mucking around by the devil, kicked around and torn up in our lives. All of that can be crushed like the head of the devil by the death of Jesus Christ. And it's so awesome to think. And Lord willing, Lord willing, I'm still hearing from God about this. But just the chapter before, Elisha laid on that dead boy's body and raised him. And there's something about baptism there. And there's a message of baptism in 1st, 2nd Kings 4 and 2nd Kings 5 with Naaman. Amen.